Thank you for choosing to listen to Phoenix Fire today. Phoenix Fire features John Anthony West. You can access the Phoenix Fire blog at www.jawphoenixfire.blogspot.com. You can learn more about John Anthony West by going to www.jawest.net. Phoenix Fire! Phoenix Fire! This is Phoenix Fire, John Anthony West, rogue Egyptologist and mystic and skeptic's clothing, broadcasting from West Tenge in the wilderness with something to offend everyone. Here's a provisional list of what's coming up in the next couple of months. Not necessarily in this order. 1. Notes from a Heretic's Notebook, Autobiography. 2. Symbolist Egypt, The Doctrine of the Return to the Source. 3. Darwin Debunked, Darwin Declawed, Darwin Dethroned. Your friendly armchair anthropologist discusses the cargo cult of the West. 4. Einstein's of Old, Ancient Symbolism, Modern Astrophysics. 5. Son of Mystery of the Sphinx, The Geo Panel and the Quest to Rewrite History, Further Sphinx Evidence. 6. Number, Ancient Key to the Cosmos. 7. Consider the Kali Yuga, Procession of the Equinoxes of the Great Year. 8. Atlantis here, Atlantis there, Atlantis damn near everywhere. 9. The Four Cowboys of Apocalypse 2.0, Capitalism, Patriotism, Democracy and Technology. 10. Science, Education, and the Media, Jesuits of the Church of Progress. 11. Debunking Debunkery, John Anthony West taking on the Mind Gestapo and the Paradigm Police. 12. Constructive Destruction and Positive Negation, Three Ways to Learn Spiritual Lessons. Stand Up Metaphysics 3.0, Comedy as a Religious Experience with Jokes. And once Phoenix Fire is underway, Tomorrow show with Jerry and John. John Anthony West and Gerald Salente, author of Trends 2000, Warner Books 1997, discuss what's likely in store. This may be weekly as well. Phoenix Fire! And so, let us begin at the beginning. Chances are, if you're tuned in to Phoenix Fire, you're at least familiar enough with my name to want to tune in, at least to see what's going to be happening. So what I will do in this introductory program is to give a bit of a summary, a kind of an abstract of the next couple of months of programming, so that you'll have some idea of who I am and where I'm coming from. Now, a question that comes up all the time whenever I do my Egypt trips, uh, whenever I give lectures, there's somebody somewhere who asks, how did I get into all of this? Am I an Egyptologist? Am I an archaeologist? What are my credentials? Depends who's asking about my credentials. If it is an Egyptologist or some other form of quackademic, my standard reply is, well, I don't have any credentials and that's why I know something. Otherwise, I'm a bit more polite about it. But the fact of the matter is that I don't have them I didn't start off as an Egyptologist. I started off, as a matter of fact, as a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, essayist, critic, with a lot of track record behind me, never any money made, but lots of track record. And I fumbled my way into Egyptology and, and the science and religion of ancient civilizations, more or less by accident. And that will be the subject of the full-fleshed or the full-blooded first program, uh, Notes from a Heretic's Notebook, which will be entirely autobiographical. Here it's enough to just put in a couple of sentences because it's this that generated the whole next 60 years of life, actually. And that is that at the age of 13, which was a long time ago, 1945 to be specific, 
I realized that I'd been born into a lunatic asylum. What puzzled me at that time was that most of the other crazy people didn't realize that they were living in a nut house. They thought that this was progress. I knew different, but I was unable to articulate it, and this made for a number of lonely years. By the time I was about 19, I had made a life decision, as it were. I wanted to be the little boy who said, the emperor has no clothes. Now, in the fairy tale, the little boy who reveals the secret of the emperor's non-clothes is implicitly recognized and everybody lives happily ever after. In real life, what happens is a bit different. And it took me quite a number of years before I took that idea of Emperor's New Clothes and produced a story out of it, originally published in Omni Magazine back in the 70s somewhere, and it's up on my website now. It's called The Emperor's New Clothes Continued. Now, what happened there in the second version or in, in the follow-up to uh, Anderson's fairy tale was that the Empire itself regroups and eventually uh, the powers that be get together and decide that the Emperor's new clothes are real after all. It's the little boy who is imaginary. So that basically explains where I come from, what's happened, and in a sense what generates this program. Phoenix Fire is an outgrowth of what to do when the entire empire <clears throat> decides that the little boy is a fiction, but the emperor's new clothes are real. So in one sense, you might say, that everything that follows from this moment on is going to be is going to be a an inquiry into the emperor's new clothes themselves in in all of its in all of their various aspects and this will take us into all sorts of places into science into history to a certain extent into politics into religion into literature um into all sorts of subjects that in one way or another are expressions of our 21st century's addiction to the emperor's new clothes and this is where we'll be heading so when the time comes for our first actual program um, or when i get into autobiography itself as i said earlier the program titles will not air necessarily in the order you've heard them but on one of those programs i'll be doing more or less of a full-fledged autobiography which is if i do say so myself rather an interesting ride taken me all over the world to years of living in Spain, years of living in Europe, back to America in 1978, and here ever since, but with all sorts of side trips and interesting events and interesting people and so forth and so on. Uh, people often say to me on my trips, uh, just in general, gee, you've had such an interesting life and I don't disagree. It had certain disadvantages, I must say, most of them financial, but... Uh, that's beside the point. The fact is that here I am, and we are talking Phoenix Fire. Phoenix Fire! Symbolist Egypt, the doctrine of the return to the source. The way to a viable future, in my opinion, and perhaps the only way to a viable future, is through a drastically rewritten understanding of the past. It's only in the past few decades that our own science has become sufficiently sophisticated to allow us to understand just how much the ancients actually did know. Now, if you're a true son of the Church of Progress and have been educated in the standard way, your vision of the past will be that it all started off with primitive cavemen types and led by a linear progression to our wonderful age of technology with our hydrogen bombs and our striped toothpaste and our Disneyland and our traffic jams and our inflatable Santas and all the rest of what makes our world what it is. <laughs> Another way of looking at it is that this is shiny barbarism. Once we understand 
the level of knowledge that existed in the very distant past at a time when it was not supposed to exist, it becomes clear that we've been conned. Our education has conned us into the belief that we are the most advanced beings that ever walked or thought upon this particular planet. It's not so difficult to disperse that idea, actually, and dispel it, but to actually experience it, really, you have to go somewhere where you can physically experience the emotional wallop that the past actually contains. And this is not so easy in America. When you walk through an Egyptian temple and you understand it from the symbolic or the symbolist point of view, you understand in two seconds, you know it in your gut, even if your head isn't ready for it yet. In your gut, you know that these were highly advanced beings that produced this extraordinary work. And now, actually over the past 50 years, really, the antidote has been there, available for the taking, but the last people who are about to take it are those who are directly concerned with it which are, of course, the Egyptologists, the archaeologists, the historians, the anthropologists. They don't want to know. And so this knowledge, Symbolist Egypt, and all of the relevant studies from other civilizations as well, more on that when we actually get into the program wholly devoted to Symbolist Egypt, this knowledge has actually been ignored, misunderstood, or deliberately suppressed by our Church of Progress, which is no less opposed to heresies as the Church of Rome ever was. The main difference is that it's no longer politically correct to burn heretics, and so here I am with Phoenix Fire. R. A. Schwala de Lubitsch, the genius with the unpronounceable name, was a French philosopher, mathematician, orientalist, and practicing alchemist. He became interested in Egypt, particularly in Egypt, back in the 1930s, and in 1937, moved to Egypt with his wife and his stepdaughter, specifically looking for certain kinds of mathematical knowledge that he felt the Egyptians must have had in order to produce those extraordinary temples. In the end, he stayed 15 years at Luxor, mainly at Luxor Temple, developing what is called the symbolist point of view. There, he was able to show that academic Egyptologists and historians had grievously misunderstood Egypt, and with it, by extension, all the rest of, of the very distant or ancient past. What is normally presented as ancient Egypt, or the view of ancient Egypt that you will get in your schools, and that goes right up through university training as well, is that Egypt was a kind of magnificent superstition, a wonderfully technologically or architecturally and artistically accomplished civilization with no science to speak of, a weird polytheistic religion, no sense of reality as we've come to know it through our science, and so on. As a matter of fact, it now turns out that they understood perfectly well the nature of the world. They just didn't divorce it from life itself. And so all of these, all of these things that we, all of these aspects of Egypt that seem to us so alien and so strange and so, in fact, so superstitious, are not so once they're approached from that symbolist point of view. All those weird animal-headed gods are not strange figments of a primitive imagination, but rather represent cosmic principles. And what are cosmic principles? Our science doesn't address that. Cosmic principles, for example, to take an organic example, because that's familiar to all of us, are, let's say, fertilization, gestation, birth, growth, maturity, senescence or old age, death and renewal. These are cosmic principles and Egypt recognized each of these principles in the form of a god or goddess, as the case may be. But these are not to be understood as primitive attempts by unsophisticated people to express the world around them. They are rather highly sophisticated ways of making clear these principles which in fact make our lives comprehensible to us. I mean, we live with birth, growth, maturity, senescence, death, renewal on a daily basis, and it is the gods that make sense of all of that, whereas our science buries it all, sweeps it all under a, a rug, <clears throat> a rather 
a rug that looks something like a Jackson Pollock painting called Evolution and forgets about it all. Once we have a grasp of what symbolist Egypt entails, we start to see, we start to get an idea of what a real civilization was and how it conducted itself and how it differs so radically from anything that we believe civilization to be. In other words, progress and civilization are not synonyms. They are almost antonyms, but not quite. And when we do our Symbolist Egypt program, we will see where our real advances lie and where we are, in fact, the primitives and they the sophisticates. Phoenix Fire! Darwin debunked, Darwin declawed, Darwin dethroned. Your friendly armchair anthropologist discusses the cargo cult of the West. Despite the rather modest and uh, uncontroversial title of this lecture, it is intended to be mildly incendiary. In other words, it is an attack upon Darwinian evolution, the very basis or you might say the central dogma of the Church of Progress. If the catechism of the Church of Progress is that we of the 21st century are the most developed or most evolved human beings ever to exist upon this planet, it is the doctrine of Darwinism, of evolution as a chance or accidental process that is its dogma. It is that that, according to Richard Dawkins, who, along with Daniel Dennett, are the co-commandants of today's current crop of Darwin Jugend, uh, according to Dawkins, it is Darwin who made atheism intellectually respectable. As a matter of fact, we will argue in this program that Darwinian evolution is anything but intellectually respectable. In fact, it is a scientific fraud, and to drive that point home, we're going to need quite a bit of time, and we're not going to be able to do it in the four or five minutes of our oral abstract, as we might call these little resumes. Uh, we need the full 55 or 60 minutes, and in fact, maybe a couple of programs in order to drive the point home. But that will be the thrust of this particular program, and in it we will we will be taking a careful look at both the proponents of Darwinism or of evolution via natural selection and their opponents. Now, this is another one of those little tricks played by the Darwin Jugend. Anyone daring to challenge the Darwinian dogma is automatically a creationist or, in a best case scenario, closet creationists. However, the logic of this is, to say the least, somewhat flawed. It is rather like George W. Bush claiming either you're with us or you're with the terrorists. It does not take an awful lot of intelligence to realize that this is a false dichotomy. It doesn't have to be like that. You do not have to agree with George Bush and his poisonous agenda uh, in order to not be one of the terrorists. It simply means you've got your rational faculties intact and have some humanity left to you so you disagree with the decider in chief, but you also disagree with the terrorists. There is plenty of room in between. However, in the world of in the world of Darwinian dogma, there is none. Either you're a Darwinian, and you may argue about, let's say, the mechanics of natural selection, but if you disagree with the basic thesis that we're all here accidentally and by a necessary extension, life is therefore entirely meaningless, anything that challenges that dogma automatically puts you in the creationist camp, according to the Darwinians. This is obviously, this is sophistry. The media cheerfully go along with this infantile and fraudulent argument, when particularly when confronting the argument that's currently known as intelligent design. It in itself is a development from Darwinian opposition that's been going on at least since 1858 or 57, whenever Darwin published his Origin of Species. And the argument, strangely enough, hasn't changed all that much, but neither has the Darwinian hypothesis itself. More upon this when we get into our complete show. Phoenix Fire. 
surprise. Until we find sponsors for our dedicated ad space, it's still John Anthony West, here to tell you about my personally guided magical Egypt tours. There's a fascination about Egypt, a glamour, a romance. On my trips, people tell me they've been dreaming of traveling to Egypt since early childhood. There are other wonderful sacred places in the world, Gothic cathedrals, Mayan pyramids, Islamic mosques, Hindu and Buddhist temples. But there is nothing anywhere that matches the grandeur, power, and perfection of Egypt. Yet unless you see Egypt through symbolist eyes, you've not seen Egypt at all. For it is only the symbolist interpretation developed by the brilliant philosopher, mathematician, and alchemist, R. A. Shvaladolubich, that makes sense of the Egyptian experience. Where establishment academics see only a bizarre, architecturally accomplished but still primitive civilization, Shvala saw and proved that it was based upon a profound and sophisticated sacred science, a science of cosmic principles. One wonders how people come back from Egypt and live lives the way they lived them before, wrote Florence Nightingale back in 1850. The answer is, they don't. Two weeks in Egypt and you will understand the difference finally between true civilization and progress with detailed information see my website jawest.net click on magical egypt tours these are one of a kind trips there is nothing like them we find ways to avoid crowds we meditate in the great pyramid we get into places other people don't get into the food is great so are the hotels the price is remarkably competitive just remember, if you don't see Egypt through symbolist eyes, you don't see Egypt at all. The fact is that, much as the media and the Darwinians would like to paint their opposition as a bunch of wild-haired, Bible-thumping creationists, the fact of the matter is, and this is rarely mentioned, that most of the people, most of the proponents of intelligent design have credentials at least as good as the Darwinians. They are biologists. They are scientists. They are microbiologists. They are paleontologists. They are fully as credentialed as their Darwinian majority. Many of them are not particularly religious or certainly not formally religious. However, this gets shoved under the carpet. This hardly gets mentioned. It's all there. Anybody putting forward intelligent design as an agenda um, or as a, as a hypothesis, as an argument, is simply a creationist or a creationist in disguise, end of argument, the science, all, scientists all agree with each other. The fact of the matter is they don't all agree with each other or there wouldn't be an argument of intelligent design. Is this then, is our point of view, um, an argument for intelligent design? Actually, it isn't, even though it sounds that way. It isn't mainly because not because they are entirely wrong or not because we argue with their argument as such. It's that they don't know how to argue. And just as the argument above, that anyone disagreeing with Darwin is a creationist, well, the intelligent design contingent, unfortunately, takes the role rather similar. It's, it's not often in, in science that you get nice little parallels to politics. But in this case, there's a very handy one and the ID contingent are rather like the Democrats who voted for the Iraq war, even though there was no evidence for it, even though it was quite clear to anybody, me included, and I don't sit in Congress, that the evidence was non-existent. And in fact, the people who knew about weapons of mass destruction, that is to say the weapons inspectors, were shouting, from the, shouting out from the wilderness that there were no weapons of mass destruction. The gutless, ballless, spineless, quiche-eating, limp-wristed Democrats went along with this fiction, and now they're in trouble because it's very difficult to back out of that position and say, oh, we were conned. Well, if they were conned by these lunkheads, why is it that me, our friends, most of the people I know, lots of people, we weren't conned. We knew better to begin with. Anyway, the ID contingent has created a terrible quandary for itself by going part way with the Darwinians. In other words, the argument is more or less, it's more complicated than this, but more or less, the argument from intelligent design goes something like, ah, yes, well, natural selection can explain certain things within evolution, but it can't explain everything. And unfortunately, this is a bit like saying, well, yes, he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but he was a bad guy anyway. This is no argument, obviously. Either he had weapons of mass destruction or he didn't. 
and so it is with with evolution and this is this will be the main thrust or will be part of the main thrust of our complete program that natural selection is itself a fraud there is no natural selection it is to science what santa claus is to christmas an indispensable marketing ploy with no basis in observed reality none but daddy daddy says your five-year-old son of course there's a santa claus there's a Santa Claus at Walmart. There's a Santa Claus ringing a bell on the street. There's a Santa Claus at the discount store. Of course there's Santa Claus. Actually, you're, if you're a good dad, you don't disabuse your five-year-old son of that fantasy. You let him grow up till he's 10 years old, and then he's figured it out for himself. With your 50-year-old Darwinian, there comes a point where he has to be deprived of his delusion because it's a, a very, it's a very dangerous delusion, much more dangerous than is generally acknowledged. More on this when we get into the program as well. But the point is that, and no one has challenged it, this is one of those instances where actually I'd rather hope somebody among my, my listeners will, will chime in with some, with some input. If you Google up Darwinian evolution, Darwin evolution, intelligent design, you will get a number of entries only marginally less than the number of molecules in the, in the entire universe as figured out by the astrophysicists, a gigantic number that is impossible to search. So it may be that the argument that I'm putting forward here or the, the let's say, the explanation that I'm putting forward has some antecedents and I haven't been able to find them. But to the best of my knowledge, no one before or no one currently challenges Darwinian evolution as a linguistic fraud, not just a scientific fraud, but a linguistic fraud. It is an instance of science speak, which is the scientific equivalent of Orwell's news speak, in which words that mean something quite clear in common parlance are used in such a way and so often and so repetitiously that eventually they're understood to mean their opposite. Again, our example from politics, when George W. Bush talks about freedom and democracy, and people understand just what he does mean by freedom and democracy, it's quite clear that he doesn't mean freedom at all, nor does he mean democracy. The words have taken on an entirely different meaning. And so it is with natural selection and with the whole lexicon of Darwinian evolutionary terms. Just look at a couple of these here. Well, there will be much more later on. But, for example, look at the two words themselves. This is Darwin's, Darwin's own words, natural selection. And by that, he meant natural as opposed to artificial selection. Let's say you want to breed bigger horses and you breed a couple of big horses together and they get a bigger horse and then the, you take the biggest of those horses and you get still bigger horse. That's artificial selection. So at a certain point, you can, you can bring the horses up to a certain size, but then strangely enough, they turn around and become, they can only get to a certain extent. They won't become Tyrannosauruses or elephants. They'll only get to a certain size and then they revert back more or less to their original size. But by natural selection, Darwin meant the opposite of artificial selection. And the assumption was that natural selection just happened accidentally out in nature. So natural now becomes a synonym for accidental. In other words, it just happens. That's what happens out in nature. But the point is that the theory is supposed to prove, if it's going to be science, that nature is in fact an accident. So if you use natural as a synonym for accident or hazard or chance, you're, you're creating a circular non-argument. It's a bit like saying that the purpose of the judicial system is to provide a trial for the guilty. The assumption being that if they're on trial, they're guilty to begin with. It ain't like that. So natural, in fact, and when we look at nature, we see that it is from the molecule up to the elephant, to the incredible structure of the brain with all the hormones and the enzymes and all of the rest of these things doing their jobs in the most complex rational fashion imaginable, that, that natural is hierarchically organized in a manner that makes anything that we as human beings do look childish and infantile and absolutely simple-minded. So natural is not actually a, a proper or a fit or an acceptable 
substitute for accident. And then we look at selection. Selection also doesn't mean accident. Selection means conscious choice. We select players for the NBA draft. We, we select candidates to run for office. De Croupier does not select the number that the ball, that the roulette ball is going to fall on, nor does the roulette wheel select the number that the ball is going to fall on. That is actually random. So natural selection is a con job. It's a linguistic con job that uses two words that mean consciousness, choice, hierarchical organization, but uses words that mean those things in order to put forward a theory that holds that we are, we human beings and the rest of organic nature, are the products of purely random chance occurrences or mutations. And actually, if the Darwinians used language appropriate to what they are actually saying, the whole thing would very shortly crumble away and everybody would, they would be, in fact, they would be the laughing stock of science if there are enough science around to recognize that they are being conned. For example, if evolution were called or if the agency responsible for evolution were termed something like accidental agglomeration or perfectly harmonically hierarchically orchestrated accidents, the whole thing might take on a very different view. And in fact, Daniel Dennett, one of the co-commandants of the current crop of Darwin Jugend, came up with a wonderful phrase himself, dismissing one of the intelligent design proponents. He mocked and said, well, we know that it's a, no more than a series of lucky coincidences. Well, that's supposed to be science. Go prove a lucky coincidence. Go show, go replicate a lucky coincidence. Measure a lucky coincidence. Predict from a lucky coincidence. This comes from one of the, one of the chief proponents of Darwinian theory. And let's call it for argument's sake and to terminate this particular little abstract here. Let's say that we're, we're looking at, at Darwinism and at evolution as a series of lucky coincidences. And that'll give us enough of a basis for the full hour when we get around to it. Einstein's of old, ancient symbolism, modern astrophysics. Now, a theme that we've discussed to a certain extent already in this rundown of episodes or programs to come is the Church of Progress dogma that we are the most advanced beings that have ever existed upon the planet. Only we, goes the dogma, have real science. Anything that went before us is just a kind of a dry run for Greece where they had a little bit of an idea that maybe there could be a science, but really there wasn't any not serious science. We're the only ones with science, and since science is the only discipline that is, really has an objective basis, Really, we're the only evolved human beings that have ever existed upon the planet. The Nobel Prize winner, Sir Peter Medauer, once exclaimed about modern science and said, science is a very great work, perhaps the greatest of all the works of man. And Otto Neugebauer, who was an astronomer and a, a student of uh, one of the, one of the principal um, scholars studying ancient Egyptian astronomy, also declared that ancient science was the work of very few men and those few happened not to be Egyptian. This was another of those attempts to uh, deny science to the Egyptians because actually science really has to start with the Greeks and the reason why science and in fact civilization is supposed to start with the Greeks is a 19th century con job uh, and this has been magisterially exposed by a very careful scholar Martin Bernal of Cornell University in a very controversial book called Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic Roots of Greek Civilization. More upon that later on in the full programming. But basically, or in a nutshell, I should say, uh, Bernal demonstrated beyond any possibility of doubt that what we think of as history, particularly history of the, of the past, is a kind of white Eurocentric con job. In other words, civilization has to begin in Europe and it has to be developed by white folks like us. 
Um, and even though the Greeks are relatively short, swarthy guys, they're a lot whiter than the Egyptians and the Jews and the Arabs and the black Africans. So in any event, there is no ancient science according to our Church of Progress. And there almost can't be because how could they have science when we have science and evolution goes, as we know, in a linear fashion from primitive to advanced, then how could anybody before us be more advanced than we are, or as advanced, or even nearly as advanced as we are? Well, there wasn't an awful lot to challenge that notion until quite recently, but to backtrack a little bit, actually, even the notion of progress, we think that that's been in place for a long time. Actually, that's an 18th century conceit. It comes out of, out of the French the philosophical movement known as the Enlightenment, which is actually only Enlightenment if you think illumination contingent upon electricity. Actually, illumination is quite something else, and so is Enlightenment, but more upon that on a, on a, on a further or subsequent program. But the whole idea of progress is relatively new, and in fact, up until, let's say, up until Newton even beyond Newton, Newton spent more, more time studying alchemy than he did inventing science, though this is another one of those quite well-kept secrets in scientific and the history of science. Anyway, it's not until more or less middle of the 18th century that the notion of progress really takes hold, and it's not until the middle of the 19th century and Darwin's, um, uh, Darwin's theory of, um, of evolution and natural selection that progress really, or the notion of progress, really grips the Western psyche, particularly the Western psyche, and suddenly becomes dogma. But the notion that more advanced civilizations existed in the very distant past, in fact, civilizations more advanced than what was going on at the time, were current in certain, particularly Western intellectual circles from the time of the dissolution of Egypt right up until progress took over. For example, when Kepler discovered his laws of planetary motion, he exulted that he had rediscovered the knowledge of the ancient Egyptians. Even Newton, looking to verify the dimensions of the Earth, sent his protege, John Greaves, to Egypt to see if he could measure the pyramids and find out if they contained, as it was rumored, and I forget exactly, it's not Herodotus, one of the Greek writers of antiquity who said that the measures or dimensions of the Great Pyramid were a model or a scale model of the, of the dimensions of the earth. In any event, the, the notion that Egypt was, particularly Egypt, but other ancient civilizations as well, were founts of high knowledge was common up until about the middle of the 18th century. And even into the 19th and into the 20th, there were always a subset of highly erudite scholars and practitioners even of the hermetic arts who maintained that Egypt, in particular Egypt, and not because Egypt was a higher civilization than any of these other places, China or India or Mesoamerica, really it's one of the reasons for its preeminence is that so much of it left. You can go to Egypt and experience it. You can't go to 3000 BC China or 3000 BC India and experience it, it. but you can. You go to Egypt, you can experience what they were doing and what they were feeling and the state of their consciousness back in 2500 BC or thereabouts. In any event, the, the notion that ancient civilizations were highly advanced and sophisticated has never quite died, but it's only in the last 50 years or so that the evidence is there. It goes back actually a bit further than 50 years. Norman Lockyer, the great British astronomer, who was the first to suggest that Stonehenge was actually an astronomical instrument, and I believe he wrote that somewhere in the 1890s or so. Everybody laughed at him, of course. It took another 50 or 60 years, I forget exactly how many, before that was quite clear that Stonehenge contained astronomical information or was designed in order to collect astronomical information, even that admission did not go to the extent of suggesting that a very advanced and sophisticated science existed in Egypt or existed in the distant past. Phoenix fire! And now, since heretics also have to eat, here come the ads. Magical Egypt, a symbolist tour in DVD and more besides.
if you can't take a trip to Egypt and experience it firsthand, well, you can't. Not everyone can, but next best and the closest you can get to experiencing Egypt is our eight-episode documentary series, Magical Egypt, A Symbolist Tour. This is the brainchild of my partner, Chance Gardner, a graphic designer and 3D animator of genius, and this series is an absolutely unique visual, emotional, and intellectual media experience. There are innumerable documentaries about Egypt, dry as dust, misleading, repetitive exercises in Egyptological establishmentarianism from the National Geographic or Discovery Channel or some other wielder of the academic cookie cutter. Pretty pictures, nothing ever that feeds the mind, the heart, to say nothing of the soul. This series fills that gap. We explore Egypt in depth. We follow the ramifications into alchemy, the tarot deck, modern DNA research, sacred geometry, the mysteries of ancient technology. There are interviews with leading edge scholars, scientists and thinkers, each contributing to a radical revision of our understanding of the past. For more information, go to www.magicalegypt.com and more. If you've not read My Serpent in the Sky, The High Wisdom of Ancient Egypt, maybe it's time you did. An in-depth introduction to Shwala de Lubitsch's symbolist interpretation. Our Emmy Award-winning classic documentary, Mystery of the Sphinx, now available in an upgraded DVD version. My guidebook, The Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt, an invaluable source of information for armchair and actual travelers to Egypt. I have a few copies of my out-of-print first non-fiction book, The Case for Astrology, left for sale. See my website, www.jawest.net. Click on books. Actually, the, the first inklings of a, a reconsideration um, came not that long after the dogma became dogma. The low point of the process may have been James Fraser's famous, enormous book, The Golden Bow, which looks into traditional and so-called primitive tribes and the various legends that they all hold, which look so very bizarre on the surface and irrational. And uh, Fraser had the typical Victorians, particularly English Victorians, snobbish attitude about anything that wasn't white contemporary in English. So the poor old primitives and traditional tribes got very short shrift from Fraser. But not that long after that, all of a sudden there were Jung and Eliade and following them, Joseph Campbell, who were arguing, at least from a psychological point of view, that these ancient myths and strange stories had a certain kind of psychological truth that still wasn't high science, and psychology is what's called a soft science, which is to say a non-science. But nevertheless, there was a, let's say, a gradual upgrading of what primitive so-called, and when I use that word, I must say I do so with inverted quotes around it. Primitive does not mean, it simply it does not mean unadvanced, actually. It simply means untechnological and unintellectualized, but in fact, the primitive shaman, for the most part, the so-called primitive shaman, is a far more developed human being than most of the astrophysicists floating around these days. In any event, the notion that an ancient high science existed develops in fits and starts, not so much gradually as by considerable contributions by a few extraordinary scholars. Uh, in 1957, Shvala de Lubitsch published his Le Temple de l'Homme, The Temple of Man, three huge volumes, which of course was I mean, absolutely repudiated by the Egyptologists. In fact, one eminent Egyptologist of the time, Etienne Driaton, who was head of the French mission in Cairo, wrote and exhorted his colleagues to erect a common wall of silence around this work. So there's our open-minded scientist for us. And so they managed to do, actually, for most of the next 50 years, except for myself and a few other symbolists, um, writers, who made Schwaller a little bit more accessible than he is to begin with. But Schwaller demonstrated in magisterial fashion that, that a high cosmic, that a science based upon cosmic principles existed in Egypt. That's 57. In 68, 1968, the two historians of science, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deckhand at MIT, put forward another not-so-easy book, 
called Hamlet's Mill, in which they demonstrated, again, pretty clearly, that the procession of the equinoxes was known to very, very ancient people, and that an advanced knowledge of at least observational astronomy was written into the myths and legends of virtually every society that has ever been, including, let's say you might not find it so amazing if there was a, a coherent astronomy in, in Egypt or India or China. And of course, we know that the Mayan calendar is astronomically based and is a very carefully, very careful and sophisticated piece of work. But we tend not to think of, let's say, the Africans or the Eskimos or the Polynesians as having a, a, any knowledge of astronomy themselves. Certainly, they don't practice a, a, an astronomy nowadays, and yet their myths and legends, which date back to time immemorial, are replete with astronomical observations and information, and all of a sudden, things that looked incoherent or barbaric or incestuous or weird uh, make perfect sense when they're understood as metaphors for astronomical facts. In the last 15 years, a number of books have uh, been appearing, most of them under the radar. They don't, get, they don't get noticed much in the New York Times or the Scientific American or the New Scientist, but they show up in Atlantis Rising and Nexus Magazine and on the web, of course, that are demonstrating in the most convincing manner possible that one of the reasons why we haven't understood all of those ancient myths and legends is that our science wasn't good enough. In other words, we needed, we needed quantum mechanics and string theory and torsion theory and contemporary cosmology, not necessarily Big Bang, but some variation thereof, maybe the, the theory that one of the, one of the opposing theories to the Big Bang, the, the theory of continuous creation. But we needed that kind of advanced thinking in order to understand that the ancients were incorporating exactly this thinking into their mythologies, into their symbolism, into their very language. And it's this subject that we will be dealing with when we do our full program on this subject. And we'll be bringing forward and possibly interviewing or having dialogues with people like Laird Scranton, author of Dogon Cosmology, Thomas Brophy, physicist, author of The Origin Map, and Richard Heath, author of The Cosmic Matrix, and a number of other erudite and brilliant researchers who are making it very clear that everything scientific, or pretty much everything scientific that we believe is original to our 20th and 21st century was not just foreshadowed, but foreknown by the Einsteins of old, by the brilliant scientists of the past who did not express themselves in mathematics as we do, making this thinking available only to those able to follow the math, which isn't me. We can see that the Einsteins of old understood their cosmology and their physics, and also, by the way, their genetics and their biology, but in a manner that was able to, that they were able to transmit to the the general public of their own civilization in a manner that was, let's say, comprehensible without necessarily having been intellectualized. People could live the truth without necessarily being able to, let's say, express it or reconvey it to anybody else. But this, when you stop and think about it, is, is, is a quite marvelous achievement because it allows everyone at his or her own level of development to actually live scientific and psychological truths in the quest to, let's say, self-develop, which is the only quest that's worth pursuing at the very end of the matter, but more upon that as we go along. Atlantis here, Atlantis there. Atlantis, damn near everywhere. Atlantis, the A word. There is no word as incendiary as the A word in the hallowed halls of the Church of Progress. There are other buzzwords that get them buzzing, 
but almost nothing like Atlantis, which is a very peculiar phenomenon when you stop to think of it. As a rule of thumb, though care is needed, anything opposed by the mind Gestapo and the paradigm police of the Church of Progress is likely to be true. What is there about Atlantis that drives them all so crazy? The notion that there was, at some point or the other, in the very distant past, a sophisticated, enlightened civilization that went down under catastrophic circumstances. This gets interesting, because the opposition that any heretical idea must face is, to a certain extent, commensurate to the threat that it poses. An Air Force friend of mine tells me that in the Air Force there's a saying, the flak is always heaviest when you're directly over the target. So there's something about Atlantis that sets the bells jangling. For example, in the halls of the Church of Progress there are many heresies. Sasquatch and Nessie just get an offhand sneer. Homeopathy, ESP, cold fusion provoke concerted attacks. They're threats to the Church of Progress. But almost nothing gets the kind of opposition that the mention of Atlantis does. And why is that? A very simple reason. If there is anything whatsoever valid about the whole Atlantis myth, the whole Atlantis legend, it is that a sophisticated civilization, a scientifically sophisticated civilization, existed in the very distant past. And the central tenet of the of our Church of Progress is that we are the most advanced human beings that ever existed on this planet. And therefore, if there were such a thing, if it were demonstrable that a civilization such as Atlantis is supposed to have been, ever existed, that would be anathema. That would be enough in its own right, almost enough, almost enough by itself to rebut the whole idea of the Church of Progress, its central dogma that we're the most advanced beings that have ever been. So with that in mind, let's look at some of the evidence for Atlantis, some of the thinking about it, whatever is involved here. As you know, this is a kind of extended trailer for the full show or shows that will subsequently follow about Atlantis itself. So here we'll just do, as it were, verbal bullet points. Atlantis itself, the story of Atlantis, comes from only one source, and that is Plato. In Plato's Critias and in his Timaeus, he, he talks about, about the civilization that came to him, or the story came to him, from his grandfather Solon, who was the great lawgiver of Athens, who himself got the story from Egyptian priests in Egypt, we're now talking about something around the 6th sixth, sixth century or so BC. Plato then recounts this myth of this extraordinary civilization. He goes into great detail that disappeared under catastrophic conditions, a tremendous flood. The origin, or let's say the cause of the flood, that he doesn't get into. But there's this tremendous flood, and Atlantis is washed away in a single night and after that, there's no more Atlantis, and this great civilization disappears beneath the waves, never to be heard of again. Now, what's interesting about this is, among other things, that we have only one Western source for it, and that is Plato. Nowhere else do we have an Atlantis story. We do, however, when we look into the matter, what we do have are deluge myths that are universal, ubiquitous. There's almost no civilization, sophisticated or, let's say, non-technological, I hate to use the word primitive, non-technological, let's say Polynesians or Eskimos or American Indians or Siberian, whoever they are out there uh, in, in Siberia. Um, practically every tribal myth, Africans, everywhere you look, everywhere you turn, there is a deluge myth about, in many cases, about high civilizations that went down under catastrophic conditions, but nothing is detailed, 
as Plato's story. Now this becomes interesting because Plato's story is the 5th century B.C. 5th or 6th, I forget. 5th, 5th century B.C. Nobody pays much of attention to Atlantis over the years except that, who is it, Francis Bacon, I think, writes a book called The New Atlantis, which is about a kind of a utopian civilization. But really, in modern terms, Atlantis comes back into common consciousness in 18, middle 1880s when this extraordinary scholar, politician, creative novelist, I think, um, Ignatius Donnelly writes his book, Atlantis, The Lost Continent, and puts together a whole bunch of extraordinary evidence looking for the origin of the whole Atlantis myth. And this book has never been out of print. It was a huge bestseller in its day, still around today, and is well worth reading because if you look at it, how Donnelly with no real libraries and no internet at his disposal managed to keep track of this thing, or how managed to do this scholarship, amazing. How he did it, I have no idea. In any event, since that time, since the 80s, there has been a, a kind of a, almost a, a sort of a cottage industry of Atlantology. And people have been looking for Atlantis all over the place. Among the candidates are, believe it or not, there is where Plato said it was, somewhere off the coast of, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And there are others who believe that it was at the North Pole. There are others who believe it was in the Atlantic Ocean, the Azores, at Round Bimini, Spain, Ireland, the Altiplano of Bolivia and Peru, believe it or not, Cyprus, and of course, Thera Santorini, the little island in the Mediterranean, the, the explanation favored by quackademics, since it fits their own imaginary historical timeline, though nothing else fits, the North Pole, Antarctica, Piri Rees map. There's a vast library of Atlantology People looking for this Atlantis myth or looking for the, the physical whereabouts of the actual Atlantis. Phoenix Fire! Obviously, there is a problem here. It arises because each researcher takes what corresponds to Plato's account um, and dismisses that which does not. And the fact is that, so far, there is no candidate sufficiently compelling to represent Plato's Atlantis. Is there a way out of this dilemma? There may be. It resides in a book by a Sufi scholar and musicologist named Ernest G. McLean, and the book is called The Pythagorean Plato. In it, he decodes or deciphers Plato's account as a musical allegory designed by Plato to teach his students through a musical metaphor what happens when a society degenerates from a high level to a tyranny. The argument raised by McLean is compelling and complicated, and we will go into this in considerable detail in our full Atlantis program. Here it's enough to say that McLean dismisses the historical value of Plato's myth altogether. However, most of you will be familiar with our Sphinx theory which holds that due to the water weathering to the Sphinx and the temples around it, it is the artifact of an advanced civilization that disappeared under mysterious conditions or circumstances at a time when, according to standard history, civilization did not exist. So we believe that Plato's Atlantis is both right and wrong. More on that later. That's all for now, folks. I hope you've enjoyed Phoenix Fire. Goodbye until next time, and remember... Even if you're a vegetarian, Sacred Cow makes the juiciest hamburger. Phoenix Fire! Show notes available at www.phoenixfire.blogspot.com Production by Geraint Hughes, www.thepodule.com. More information on John Anthony West is available at www.jawest.com.